Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here and to speak on a topic that worries me so much as uh, time and temporality in literature does. Um, what I will present to you today is part of a broader research project about the forms of temporal experience we see in literature. Um, it is an excerpt from the book um, I wrote together with my colleague Amina Venetian. Um, Julia already mentioned it on um, the present tense novel. Uh, in, in this book we followed, uh, so our concern was to follow the novel's conquest of the present tense over the course of 20th century. Um, as you might know, um, classical narrational fiction um, is characterized by narration in the fictional preterite, uh, in which the narration retreats in service of what is narrated, the plot in the service of the story, or to borrow the Russian terms, the narrational sujet makes itself invisible in the service of the fictional fabula. The norm for the novel was, up until the beginning of the 20th century, to use the preterite alone, which did not signify the past, but induced what is known or famously analyzed by Kit Hamburger as presentification, vergegenwärtigung, make something present. That is uh, the suggestion of an instantaneousness, the fictional here and now in the reader's mind. Um, so the shift concerning the rise of the present tense novel is directed against narrative retrospection and against fictional re representation of the past. In the early 20th century, the present tense slowly starts to diffuse in a, in, as a persistent narrative tense. The first examples are interior monologues such as Kipnitaev, Koti Pietaev by Andrei Bieli, and documentaries like People at One Stake by Sergei Tretyakov. In um, my talk this afternoon, I will give you a more detailed description of that historical shift from the classical novel uh, in the epic Preterie to the modern present tense novel, in which Russian avant-garde photography plays a key role. For this, it will be necessary to understand the function of the tenses in narration and fiction. So my talk will consist of four parts. In the first part, I will introduce to you the logic of fiction according to Kitty Hamburger and the specificity of uh, the tenses in fiction as she explains it. My goal is to look at what Tretyakov's photography could mean if we view it from the perspective of fictional temporality. In the second part, I will change my methodological perspective and describe photographic temporality in contrast to narration, and therefore briefly enlist Harald Weinrich's view on the difference between a narrated world and a um, discussed world or a world of discourse. Um, in the third part, I will sum up the theoretical considerations about the relationship between narration, tense, and fiction in a historical model, which we have called the classical matrix of narrated fiction in our book. Um, in my final and fourth part, I will trace the usage of the present tense in Tretyakov's photography over this background of a law of the genre and its supposed breakdown in the avant-garde. My thesis will be that the switch in the tense form um, Preterite to present in Tretyakov's photography does not already mark a break with the classical matrix of narrated fiction, but instead confirms its rules in the very act of avoiding them. I will start now um, with the first part on Kita Hamburger, who opened up the discussion about tense usage in the novel with a fundamental thesis that the Preterite alters its meaning in the novel. It loses, I quote, its grammatical function of designating the past, end quote, instead marking its entry into a timeless present of fiction. According to Hamburger, it is, it is this irregular use of literary, of literary tense that is responsible for the fact that the experience of fiction is opened up to the reader. The classical example is Tomorrow Was Christmas. It also means that the temporal meanings of literary tenses is not to be confused with temporal meanings outside fiction. By the way, 
have we, uh, we have here what every literary scholar dreams of, a criterion for the definition of fiction. Uh, concerning to Hamburger, um, the, then every novel um, is a detemporalized tempus preteritum, do not long or signify the past, but the fiction here and now. Um, whether an event is narrated analeptically or proleptically in relation to the development, um, all of its moments are equally fictionally present despite being in the preterite. Contrary to Searle's assumption that there are no linguistically comprehensible characteristics of fiction, and Banfield has radicalized Hamburg's theorem by calling fictional sentences unspeakable sentences. Robert Cohn in a modification of Hamburger's theorem, assigned the temporal circumstances and narratives to the elementary signposts of fictionality. Uh, Cohn has shown that within fiction, retrospectivity always implies the levels of fabula and sujet, which have more or less the same <coughs> relation as past and present. How this leads us back to the question of fictionality can be seen when Cohn remarks that the past of an event cannot be established in relation to its narration by means of fabula and sujet alone. Rather, fictional fabulas are all, always synchronous with their sujets. At the same time, the fabula constructs itself as the sujet, the story in the course of its narration. Even the indexicality of assigning dates fall victim to the logic of fiction, as Hamburger already has noted. A retrospection of the sujet, the past of the story in relation to the act of narration, can only come about, as Cohn was able to show, by enlisting a third level alongside fable and sujet within narration, namely that of reference. I now come to the second part um, of my talk in which I will discuss Weinrich's work, where tenses take on the function of differentiating the narrated world and the discussed world. He divides the tenses into two groups. The one, um, on the one hand, those of discussing, sprechen, including the present. And on the other hand, those um, used in narrating, erzählen, which include the preterite. Quote, within the discussed world, the present tense can be designated as the zero tense, or as featureless as can the preterite within the narrative world. The preterite, in particular, is a tense in the narrated world. It signals the narrative situation per se, end quote. This is, for example, um, it is, I quote again, <coughs> characteristic of the formal-like opening of all fairy tales to be written in the preterite once up in a time, there was. This tense in the opening formulation is a signal that, that says, it is here that the narrated world begins. All tenses in the fairy tale narration respond to this opening signal like a constant echo, reminding us over and over again that we are in a different environment than the one surrounding us in our everyday life, and that makes it demands on us. In a certain period of time after the signal, once upon a time, only the world of the fairy tale endures. End quote. The end of the narrated world and the re-entrance of the discussed world are also marked by tenses, by formulations such as, and if they haven't died, they are still living this way today. With such a closing formulation, the tenses of the narrated world are abundant and at the same time as those of the com commented world, here perfect and present, take their place. For, this, for with these tenses, the genuine world will also make its demands in what follows. To sum up um, the first and second parts of my talk, we have seen that the fictional and narrational function of tenses especially of the preterite. In my third part, I, to which I will turn now, I will show the correlation of these three parameters, um, narration, fiction, and tense, in a consistent matrix. 
while the matrix of classical narra narrational fiction had been taken over by the avant-garde and rejected in total as a fiction generator, this matrix would gradually lose its stability over the course of literary history in the 20th century. This can be seen in the breakdown of the three central dichotomies of this matrix, fabula sujet, um, fictional factual, preterite present. These pairs no longer form a systematic and coherent whole that had once established their organization within the matrix. In the classical system, each of the poles formed two series. Of the series fabula fiction preterit, we, uh, we can roughly say the fabula is conceived as fictional and past. Uh, for the series sujet fact present, the guideline used to be the sujet is factual and present. And it, and it is from these equations that the coherence of the entire system follows, in which all the categories in use can be translated into one another as follows. The factual sujets presentifies the fictional fabula. In the earliest attempts to get away from this system, for instance by Rosanov or by Virginia Woolman, the use of the present tense still conforms to the system, merely doing without the elements that would give rise to contradiction. This is also why the present uh, texts of modernity could only use a small portion of the possibilities available within the matrix of narrational fiction. This led to short-circuiting of the remaining parameters of the factual, the sujet, um, the first person and the present tense, um, for instance, under the marker of the autobiographical. I will now come to my final part, in which I will discuss the position <coughs> of avant-garde photography in the development of the present tense novel over the course of the 20th century. Since modernity, we can observe a successive distanciation from the matrix of classical narrational fiction. This occurs on uh, quite a variety of levels. On the one hand, there are metafictional texts in which authors like Hamsun or Shkowski experiment with the existing tools in order to expose the mechanisms of fictional construction or to break through in the direction of an imaginary basis of fiction. While in this case, fiction maintains its reflective quality, there are also the declaration and manifestos of the Russian avant-garde that explicitly set themselves against fiction. Literary forms experimented with uh, for this purpose are meant to avoid the fiction effect as much as possible. Admittedly, the texts of the Russian avant-garde, for example, those of Sergei Tretyakov, which shun the preterite in favor of the present tense, confirm the effect of the epic preterite in relation to fiction and narration as described by Hamburger and Weinrich. First, um, the present tense um, is intended to produce a kind, of, a kind of factography. In Russian, it's called literatura facta through which the constitution of a fictional fabula is ruled out. Second, the agitation against the fictional fabula involves a prejudice for actual linguistic work on the sujet, through which its inconspicuousness, and as a result, a fundamental requirement for the formation of classical fiction is restricted. The novel should be replaced by operative sketches, a writer whose work could only spring from paper people, by the journalist who has to do with living people. Um, I want to give you a quote uh, by Tretyakov. I have it in Russian. Does it make any sense to read it in Russian, or shall I read it only in the English translation? Read it in Russian. So um, try, try to sense the tenses. Um, Johnny zavut jego bliski. Johnny zavut jego совершенно nieznakomej berlinskiej raboci. On brat Wilena Gertzfelde, dyrektor rasporiadzicieja radikalnego izdatelstwa Malik Felak. Zaniawszego 
своими изданиями почетное место на гитлеровском костре. Книжное дело за капиталистическим рубежом совсем не похоже на наше. Наша книжная витрина – это сотни, если не тысячи названий на разные вкусы и темы. Там книжная витрина – одна, одно, два, ну, много, пять названий. Книга издателей наровит выпустить такую книгу, чтобы она стала шлагером, боевиком. И вот в кабинете этого солидного директора, где диктофон переливает в уши машинистки, консервированную на восковом валике спокойную речь, где телефон с десяти кнопками для дачи приказания, во все отделы, где муш... муштрованные секретари и механизованная наклейка марок на конверты, появляется Бестер Китон. Вы помните этого трагического комика американских экранов, никогда не улыбающегося шуплого одержимого. Джонни is what those close to him call him. Johnny is what the Berlin workers call him, who don't even know him. He is the brother of Wieland Herzfelder, the executive director of the Radical Malik publisher, which, is, which was honored for its publications at Hitler's book burning. The book business in capitalist countries is in no way similar to ours. Our book displays there are hundreds, even thousands of titles, works for the widest range of tastes and with the most varied topics. In the shop window there, you see one, two titles, maybe five it's, if it is really a big shop. The book publisher is therefore very keen to bring out a book that will become a bestseller. And there, in the workrooms, this respectable di director appears. There where the dictaphone trickles, a calm speech recorded on a wax cylinder into the stenotypist's ears. Where there's a telephone within ten, with ten buttons to give comments to all the departments, where there are drilled secretaries and where envelopes are stamped by an automatic machine, a Buster Keaton. They are, surely they are surely reminiscent of this tragic comedian of the American film who never smiles, who is so lanky and obsessed. Using Weinrich's terminology, we could say that Tretiakov here presents us with a discourse about the world, an actual world, and not a fictional one. He expresses this by using the present tense. The persons he describes are not the characters of the fabula, but writers, publishers, and journalists. That is, persons whose professional activities um, consist of making avant-garde art. The photography refers to the act of constituting art, art or artworks, and the reference to the actual whose takes on a self-referential character. Tretiakov's facticity refers to the narratological distinction between fabula and sujet. Temporal relations between the two levels of narration are generally only noticed when one assumes a self-evident retrospectivity of narration that makes it possible to look back past events as a way of telling a story. This understanding, however, obscures the particular genuine temporality of both the fabula and the sujet. In our book, we are using the formalist um, terms fabula and sujet as basic categories uh, to characterize two levels which can be distinguished in all narrative text, whether these uh, two are understood as a dualism between fiction and narration of story and its rhetorical form, or of an extra artistic reference of the text and its literary materiality. The sujet is the constitutional act of the literary text, whether this accused to a producer um, or a recipient. Um, and it's the place of all its guises, the place of literary and rhetorical technique, the archive of the artistic formal canon, narrative voice, the scene of writing. In the fabula, the narrative text um, of narrative text, the action gets an unfortunate sense. A story takes its surprising course, or the world changes from character. Its fundamental operation is sequ sequentializing. The fabula is the object of narrative text, which always precedes the reader and which the reader is always trying to track down.
With the fabula, narrative texts aim for a reference, for dynamic space into which actions can unfold, for persons whose subjectivity is formed in their history, and for a time that opens them up. The pathos of the fabula can thus be formulated as um, Theodore Adorno wrote, history is the content of artworks. What rules at this level is the dynamic of the imaginary, fiction and reference. After this uh, terminological clarification, we finally can come back to Trichikov's writings, in particular his critique of the fabula. The interweaving that be, he criticized of fabula and sujet with fiction, primarily 19th century fiction, can roughly be summarized as follows. The factual sujet narrates the fictional fabula. In the factographies, the rejection of fiction in favor of fact is accompanied by a rejection of the fabula. This fabulousness, often called storyless in translation, <coughs> is dependent on the self-reflexivity of the process of literary communication, that is, on a self-awareness of the sujet, a critique of previous literary practice and a demand of a new one. So in Tretyakov's sketch about Brecht, we read, Tavarish Brecht, Podomaitis Vashova Niskova Kresla na Pochna Sharnem Rach Kalenak Sustav. Peristanti na Sekundu Pitis Bushoni Likur in Mazakuchini. Pachimo eti ludis des, ani na ychekach, ni v guli meeting of his rabotu. Pachimo? В здешнем домословии и словодымии не почудилось слово «штамптиш политик». В каждой пивнушке есть свой завсегдатай. У этих завсегдатаев есть свой стол «штамптиш». За этим столом они пьют пиво и разговаривают о политике. А пиво наживает себе слоновую печень от разговоров, полную отвычку от политического действия. Вы – человек Советского Союза и прямого действия, отвечает Брехт. Um, comrade Brecht, raise yourself up from the low armchair by the precisely functioning hinge of your knee. Leave behind for a moment the wish, vicious leaker of syllogism. Why are these people here and not in the party cells? Why not in the blast of the assemblies of the unemployed? Why is the word barroom politics pressing on, my, on me? out of the clouds of smoke and the smoke of thoughts. Every bar has its regulars, and these regulars have their table, indeed, the regulars' table. At this table they drink their beer and prattle on about politics. From the beer they get an inflamed liver, from their prattling they get abstinence from political activity. You are a man of Soviet Union and of immediate action, answers Brecht. If literature thematizes itself, speaks only about itself, then it discusses and documentarizes its emergence, and in the same breath also the tenses it uses. Present tense means present time, and preterite means the past. In terms of fiction theory, um, in accordance with Hamburger's assessment that the first person narrative is not fictional, Tretyakov, in fact, um, okay, in fact, grants no timeless meaning of tense. Instead, the present tense seems to mean the present time in a quite documentary sense. I come now to my conclusion. Mm, from the literary historical viewpoint, we should note the following. The tense shift from the preterite to the present tense does not initially evolve a systematic break. The factographic text do indeed avoid the fictional epic preterite, instead using a documentary present, but they use it precisely in the sense that Harald Weinrich defined, namely as discussing and not as narrating. In the avant-garde factographies, the documentary present tense maintains its discussing fiction. The definition of the values that had been in place for narration and fiction theory in the 19th century, this remains the same. The only thing that is altered is the signifier of its aesthetic value, whether it is seen as positive or negative. Thank you. <laughs>